right, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to uh, a discussion on WebEx calling. Uh, my name is Benjamin Nguyen. I'll be the presenter during this session. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to go through and talk to you guys a little bit about what WebEx calling is, the overview, um, and I guess your objectives for the next hour is to be able to define what is WebEx calling. Uh, what does it provide for us? Um, how is it any different than any other phone system that we may have like call manager um, or something that's hosted on the cloud? Um, we'll be able to see what the benefits are to kind of migrating to WebEx calling. And um, at some point in time, at the very end, we'll talk about how all of the things work um, and how we're going to tie everything together. Okay. Um, so first off, before we talk about WebEx calling, what is WebEx? Um, it is just a suite of applications here um, that can be that can give us collaborative services, right? It gives us unified communications. It can give us a phone system. Um, what we end up seeing with WebEx is it has four different kind of flavors out there. We have um, WebEx Teams, right? If you guys have never dealt with Teams before, um, there is, you know, a chat function, uh, collaboration, uh, the ability for us to be able to share our screens or share files with other people, right? Um, think of Skype, think of Microsoft Link back in the day, right? That's kind of Cisco's um, answer to that, right? So cloud-based chat sessions. Um, so that's one of them. Um, another thing about WebEx is we have meetings, right? So if you've ever attended a WebEx meeting before, um, this is another flavor that's out there in WebEx. Um, we can schedule, uh, again, we can collaborate, we can um, host meetings if we want. Um, another thing about WebEx is we also have WebEx calling, which is essentially a cloud-based PBX that provides um, calling functionality for us um, using this WebEx product, right? Um, and then another thing that we have out there is Contact Center. So WebEx Contact Center is also a place where we can have a subscription of an app for an application um, and we can get Contact Center services. Um, and this whole idea of WebEx and everything being in the cloud um, kind of unifies our communication, collaboration, um, and it's kind of our one-stop shop for all things collaboration here, right? Um, what we're going to do is focus on the WebEx calling portion, um, at least for this discussion, right? So we're going to dive into that and we'll talk about what the benefits are of why we should be using WebEx calling. Um, and so just a little history here. Uh, what is WebEx calling? It is, um, well, traditionally, right, um, back in 2018, Cisco acquired Broadsoft um, and some of Broadsoft's services. Um, one of the services that Broadsoft um, had or offered to their customers was this idea that we had a cloud-based PBX, right? Um, so when we acquired it, we used to call this product uh, Spark Calling, uh, but now as we know it, it's called WebEx Calling, right? Again, cloud-based PBX. Um, they do specify that this is a unified communications as a service, right? Um, which is also compared to things like software as a service. They're probably one and of the same. So unified communications as a service, software as a service, what is that to you guys? What is the difference here? Anybody have anything to say about that? If you don't, that's okay. Um, I guess I'm here to tell you that, but um, I guess this is a big change as to uh, what we're traditionally used to, right? Traditionally, we're used to having a call manager and or on-prem based PBX. Um, and so what would happen is we would own that server, would, we would own that piece of software. We would have to manage that piece of software um, on our own, right? And again, we would still get support from Cisco. Um, but as soon as we move to, you know, uh, 
software as a service or unified communications as a service, the ownership is no longer ours. Um, now what we're doing is we're paying some provider out there to provide us this service. Um, we might not own any of the servers that house this WebEx calling application. Um, we might be a little bit hands off when it comes to configuration. Um, and you know, that might be a good thing too, because if you don't want to configure your, you know, phone system, or you don't want to take care of your phone system, you can pay somebody else to do that. Right? So, um, this WebEx calling product is essentially software as a service. You're paying somebody else to provide you these services. Um, and you know, you might not have to take care of it, right? You might have a provider make all of the configurations for you. Um, and basically babysit the system. Um, so another thing that we have to ask is, who is selling these services? Is Cisco selling these services directly to you or what's going on here, right? Who's providing the services? Who's hosting the services? So typically um, with WebEx calling, what's happening is um, Cisco doesn't directly sell you these services, right? So if you want to get um, connected with WebEx calling, you need to talk to one of Cisco's partners um, and they're the ones that are going to be authorized. So um, Cisco partners will be authorized to be able to sell you this product. Um, they'll set up the product for you. Um, try to get some kind of PSTN connection if you want to make calls to the PSTN. Um, but Cisco hosts the service, right? They own the service, I guess. Um, it's just the partners are the ones that are selling you these services. So a couple of things that I kind of wanted to note there. Um, so that you guys can be aware of who's selling what and who owns this stuff, right? So um, everything is all cloud-based, right, folks? Um, it seems like cloud is going to be kind of the flavor of the month so far. Um, and a lot of people want to try to migrate and transition to the cloud. Why? Because, you know, there are benefits to migrating to the cloud, like always on availability. Um, and it does reduce some costs as well. Since we are moving towards the cloud, we don't have to buy physical equipment anymore, right? Um, we don't have to take care of that. Um, upgrades, we don't really have to upgrade anything on the cloud. We can hope that, you know, Cisco will upgrade the software or platform for us. So anyway, um, cloud-based PBX. Um, it also offers us a couple of different ways that we can go in and experience WebEx calling. Uh, we can uh, download native applications for WebEx calling so that we can make calls, listen to voicemails, their desktop, there are mobile applications to help us with that. Um, there is an integration with Teams. So if you guys have ever dealt with WebEx Teams before, again, Teams is the whole chat-based functionality for Cisco, right? Cloud-based. And if you guys have a software subscription to WebEx calling, you should be able to access WebEx Teams as well. Um, so it is fully integrated with WebEx Teams so that you can make calls on Teams, okay? Um, and then it also offers us a way where we can actually register physical phones to WebEx calling as well. So um, even though you may not have a physical PBX or call manager on your own on-prem, um, you can still register a physical device, if that's what you want, to WebEx's cloud, right? So we'll talk about some of the different supported devices here in just a moment. Um, other than that, yeah, PSTN connectivity with WebEx calling, um, it is integrated, but uh, I just want to let you guys know that um, WebEx calling is not your PSTN. So even though there is integration for PSDM connectivity here, typically speaking, it is the provider, the one that's selling you these services, they're going to be the ones responsible for giving you this PSTN connectivity. Now, um, Cisco already has PSTN integration, but it does not mean that they are handling your PSTN calls. That's typically going to be um, somebody else that's gonna be doing that for us, okay? So um, you can use cloud-based connected PSTN from WebEx calling. So you may have a cloud here that's hanging off of, you know, the WebEx calling cloud that you can integrate with. So that there's that option. Or if you are in your local site, 
and you have some type of a voice gateway and or a Cisco unified border element, right? Or session border controller, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you have a connection to the PSTN this way. Um, you can also use your existing PSTN infrastructure. Right, so um, there's a lot of different types of connections here that we can have with WebEx calling. It makes it a little bit flexible for the end user and um, you know the, the different options that they have. Okay. Anyway, uh, pretty basic there. Um, another benefit of using WebEx calling, well, it's globally available, right? So um, here I got the snippet from Cisco. And they tell you that it's globally available. Now, um, there are certain places that you can see there's a different color coordinations here. There's a there's blue, which is what Cisco is authorized to sell this product in, right? So they can sell in these different locations. They can deploy in these different locations. So uh, you can have 64 different markets here, and I believe that number is just going up, right? So. Last time I checked with Cisco at the end of quarter two, it should be up to like 89 different um, markets out there. So, um, but I, I, I just wanted to put in the official numbers for you guys here. So um, there are other places like the, that are green that tell you that this is branch only. This means that um, WebEx calling can be deployed at these places, but not yet sold at these places, right? And then there's of course an embargo on, you know, certain countries that you know, WebEx calling can't be deployed or sold in, so. As far as support is concerned, um, the UX or UI that you would be logging into to access kind of like the um, uh, the phone application and, um, you know, to uh, manage the configuration within Control Hub, that UX UI is provided in seven different languages, okay? And um, I guess you will also have partner support service provided in six different languages. So lots of support um, and um, it is just growing here. Right, so I know this picture only shows like half of the world here, but it is starting to expand to other parts of the world. So anyway, um, there is a global availability updated here. If you guys wanna click on this, I can send you guys this slideshow at the very end of the meeting. So if you guys want this information, you guys will have nice little clickable links here that you guys can go through and um, see where it's available and see where you can you know, uh, work with this product, okay? Um, yeah, so that's one of the other benefits of WebEx calling is um, it is globally connected, right? So if you have a multinational PBX or you have a multinational, um, you know, um, corporate or enterprise, um, you dealing with WebEx calling works because it's already connected to the PSTN and it's be, you know, these services are offered at a lot of different places. So awesome. Um, so again, we're going to try to define what is WebEx calling and what are the things that WebEx calling can do. So I guess what I want to transition to is I want to talk about WebEx calling and the different station types that you guys can essentially register to this cloud-based PBX, right? Um, so we have three different flavors here for station types. These are physical um, devices that we can register to our WebEx calling um, platform. And so you have enterprise, you have basic, and you also have common area station types, right? Um, let's talk about enterprise first and foremost. It's fully featured business solution. Um, with these type of devices, okay, or endpoints, um, they will have a full set of PBX telephony features, right? So call waiting, right? Voicemail. Um, integration with WebEx Teams, WebEx Meetings. Um, if you want to have some type of auto attendant, if you want to do hunting, right? Uh, call forwarding, all of that stuff is available for enterprise level, you know, station types. Um, and, you know, typically these station types, like these phones, are associated with an end user, kind of like how it's done in Call Manager, right? Um, except when we're dealing with WebEx calling, the idea here is um, you would probably be paying for this subscription at some point in time, right? Because a lot of this stuff is software as a service or unified communications as a service. What you'll be licensing here is the end user, right? On who's using this kind of product. And once you've 
kind of associated a user or you purchased a license for a user, you can then associate that enterprise station type to that user. Okay. Um, and you get a full suite of other things too. You get mobility features, uh, you get remote access, right? Um, again, security is a big thing with WebEx calling. We'll talk about more of that when we get to, into the architecture of all this. So um, the other station type that we get to see is we get to essentially put a basic station type in. Um, it still allows for a full set of PBX calling features. So you still get the same calling features that you get in the enterprise, but one of the differences here is you're limited to mobility features here, all right? So um, the in these environments where you might have static users that aren't moving um, a lot, or if you have like shared desk locations, right? Um, sometimes it's best to kind of associate a basic station type instead if the people are not moving around that much. Okay, so the only big difference between enterprise and basic really is that whole idea of mobility, right? Because basic station types don't have that functionality. Okay. Um, and then the last kind of station type for physical station types that we want to talk about here is the common area, right? Um, when we think about these type of devices, these would be kind of like your lobby phones, your door phones, your cafeteria phones. Um, these are going to be phones that are placed in areas for public use, right? And when you think about those type of phones, we really don't want to have um, that many features for those phones, right? You don't want call waiting for those phones. You don't want them to be able to access things like uh, mobility services, extension mobility, or WebEx Teams or WebEx Meetings, because it's not essentially associated to a single person. It is a kind of like a phone that you're going to have out there for uh, public use, right? Um, so yeah, very limited telephony feature sets here. No Teams or Meetings integration. And um, typically these are going to not be associated with the user, but it's going to be associated with the location or place, okay? So um, as far as that is concerned, I guess we get to see a picture of some of those supported phone types here. So the supported station types, if you will, you can, um, yeah, it supports 6,800 series phones, 7,800 series, 8,800 series desk phones, right? And some analog ATAs. Um, I didn't put the full thing on here for you guys to see, but um, I do have a couple of links at the very end of these slides that kind of link you up to all of um, the things that are supported. So, um, so those are some of the supported devices that we were just talking about, right? And as you guys can see here, some of this stuff is integrated with WebEx meetings, WebEx teams, right? So you can essentially join a WebEx meeting from these phones, right? Uh, your 88 and uh, 6800 series phones, sure. Um, then there are different clients that you guys might be working with when dealing with WebEx teams. So here they show you a picture of kind of like what Teams looks like, right? So if you've never gotten on to Teams before, Teams is, again, that chat functionality from Cisco's cloud. But you can have this kind of um, integration where if you click on the person you want to talk to, and then there could be a dropdown when selecting the call button, right? And this dropdown can essentially tell you, oh, well, if you're integrated with the WebEx calling app, you can actually launch that call from that WebEx Teams page, or you can launch that call from the local uh, WebEx calling application. So there's two different applications. They kind of look the same, but the colors are a little bit different, right? So on the left-hand side, you see Teams. On the right-hand side right here, you tend to see the WebEx calling application. Right. And then again, you can install that WebEx calling application on a lot of different devices on your desktop, on your mobile, Android tablet, iPad, right? Um, iPhone, Android phone. So um, lots of different options on how to access this stuff. So if the physical device doesn't work for you guys, right, you can always use the WebEx app application. So, um, or you can use both, right? Um, there's flexibility in that. So, Um, anyway, um, let's talk about how easy it is to deploy these devices, 
right? Um, because one of the things about this is uh, what if you already have a phone system? Um, is it possible for you to kind of transition to the cloud slowly? Absolutely, right? Um, because with this WebEx calling, you can use some of your existing phones and you can kind of migrate them to this WebEx calling um, you know, platform. So the things to note about that though, uh, for the ease of transition, because you're not gonna go to the cloud right away, um, you're gonna slowly transition to the cloud is typically what Cisco's expecting here. But um, the things to know for these requirements are that you do need to have a multi-platform phone. We call these MPP phones, right? And um, these multi-platform um, phones would be like your 68, 7800 series or 8800 series phones. Um, and in order for those phones to kind of register and talk to WebEx calling, what needs to happen is you have to have a specific firmware to be able to, um, you know, go talk to WebEx calling, okay? Um, when you purchase these phones and you take a look at the MAC addresses and uh, the serial address, typically the serial address will tell you whether or not that phone was meant for enterprise firmware or if it was meant for a multi-platform phone firmware. And so when we take a look at those um, serials, right, when you're purchasing from Cisco, if you are purchasing these devices to be just for WebEx calling, there will be certain serial numbers that are meant um, and preloaded with the multi-platform uh, phone firmware. Um, but if you buy it for enterprise, it will come with the enterprise firmware. Um, to be able to register one uh, to a, a phone to one platform or the other, um, it's not as easy as just, oh yeah, I wanna just download the new firmware, right? Um, specific phones are meant for those specific platforms. But one of the good things with WebEx calling is when you start to purchase um, these licensings for the users, each user license comes with a migration license, right? So um, typically if you're going to migrate, there is a cost associated to that. But for WebEx calling, they give you at least one migration license so that you can convert from an enterprise firmware to go to a multi-platform phone firmware. Okay, but one of the that's one of those requirements here is that um, you do need the right firmware to be able to talk to WebEx calling. Okay, and again, um, it, it typically when you buy these licenses for an end user, it does come with one migration license, so you can take the enterprise license, transfer it over to the multi-platform uh, phone firmware. Okay. And again, why do they allow you to do this? Because they understand that, you know, this transition is not going to be overnight, right? It's not like we're going to take our 20,000 user, you know, on-prem call manager and we're going to uh, take all of those end users and put them over on WebEx calling in one day, right? So this migration could take some time, right? That's why they allow us to do that. Um, Another thing that we want to talk about is uh, the global discovery service, which they call GDS here. It enables easy and cost-effective phone distribution and provisioning of our endpoints. Now, the idea here is um, as an administrator or as a provider of services, if I'm selling you this product and I'm trying to onboard you, the customer, right? Uh, one of the things that I have to do first and foremost is I have to log into what we like to call the control hub, okay? Um, now, the control hub is basically where you'll be managing this WebEx calling platform. Um, it's where we're going to be, you know, allocating our licenses and or, you know, uh, requesting for more licenses or doing any kind of directory stuff or turning on any phone features. All of that typically happens in the control hub, okay? Um, this is typically going to be accessed using a web browser, using the World Wide Web. So all the configuration and stuff that you're gonna go to, you're just navigating to some place online for WebEx calling, and uh, you'll be able to log in as an administrator account and start to kind of, um, you know, uh, configure all of these features. Uh, what's going to happen at this point in time is when you log into the control hub, uh, you'll be able to 
add end users. And once the end user is added, then you can go in here and you can assign a device to that end user, okay? So what happens here is when you assign a device to the end user, um, Control Hub will automatically generate this 16 digit activation code, okay? And this activation code is typically generated from the global discovery service that Cisco's housing, okay? The idea is we're gonna take that 16 digit code and we're gonna place it here inside of our physical phones, the phones that have that multi-platform phone firmware. And um, once you place that 16 digit activation code, as soon as you plug that phone in and that phone's connected to the internet, it automatically talks to the internet and tries to talk to that global discovery service. And then it um, shares a 16 digit activation code uh, with the GDS service. Um, and it allows for this phone to be able to register from anywhere in the world, right? So it, that's what they mean by it makes things a lot easier to be able to register and cost effective for phone distribution. Again, you can just, as long as that phone has a 16 digit activation, um, you can take it anywhere you want. You can take that phone home, right? Um, plug it in, as long as there's some kind of internet connection, it will be able to establish a connection to the WebEx calling cloud. Okay. So it does make things very, very easy. Um, and um, yeah, comparatively to kind of like registering things to a call manager or to some other kind of PBX, IP PBX system. Okay. Any questions so far, folks? All right. Well, um, so I'm not gonna go through these next few slides, but I just kind of wanna show you guys. If I do end up emailing you these slides, um, a lot of people have a question as to, hey, what do these endpoints do, right? Uh, what are the features of WebEx calling? That's why I'm here. So I've dedicated like the next kind of 10 pages to kind of show you guys all that. I don't wanna go through all of them, but just so you guys can take a peek, right? Um, I have your three different station types. I got your enterprise station, your basic station, and your common area station for like your lobby phones, cafeteria phones, and whatnot, okay? Um, what's going to happen here is every station type has different kind of feature sets, right? So um, you'll notice some of them have yes, some of them have no. Some of them are not available, so that's kind of why they're left blank here, but um, you can kind of see for the enterprise versus basic, we have access to like WebEx calling app or to access to WebEx teams, right? Um, we both have access to the alternate number stuff. So if you guys wanted to know the differences between the different station types and all the features that you have access to, I guess these next few slides will interest you, right? So again, um, I'm not gonna go through all of these things, but you can kind of tell there's a lot of different features that we're kind of used to with our own PBX systems, right? Push to talk remote office, right? Sequential ring, um, shared call or shared line appearances, up to 35 shared lines, right? Uh, we have three-way call, so ad hoc conferencing. Uh, we have access to unified messaging for things like Teams and or talking to things like our Java client, right? So. Anyway, four pages of the differences between your three different station types, right? Um, and then there's your calling applications. This is different because these are not your physical phones, but these are going to be like the different kinds of applications that you can use WebEx calling for. So again, you have one flavor of this stuff in WebEx Teams. Um, and again, with WebEx Teams, you're getting the chat functionality, right? Just like with Skype or Microsoft Link as they used to call it. Um, and with Cisco's chat platform, I guess the idea here is to co collaborate, right? Um, to be able to share stuff. So you can do share screen, you can do a share file, um, you can create separate team spaces that people can belong to, uh, like chat rooms, right? So persistent chat rooms, all of that stuff supported here. Um, with the integration of WebEx calling, the idea is when you select a person and then you select your little call button right here, there should be a drop down that kind of shows up and um, you can launch the call locally from WebEx Teams or you can cross launch that into 
your WebEx calling application. Um, that decision, though, is basically controlled within the control hub. Remember, we talked about that control hub before. That's where you're logging into to kind of manage your you know, WebEx calling um, PDX system. So um, from the control hub, you can change that calling behavior. Do you want Teams to take care of this calling or do you want to send that to another application like WebEx calling? So there is some inherent integration here with some of Cisco's collaboration products, which is nice, right? Um, if you take a look at the mobile or desktop application here, um, you'll notice that the WebEx calling app can be installed on desktop, mobile, iPad, Android, or Chromebook. And you essentially have most of the same functionalities between all of those products, right? You can make phone calls, you can make video calls, you can join in on, you know, meetings, okay, and whatnot. You just got to put in the right, um, you know, I guess like meeting ID um, inside of your search space here. Um, you can make direct calls to people. You can join in on uh, multi-point phone calls. So, um, but there are some differences between the different calling applications that I want you guys to be aware of, right? So I kind of uh, listed some of those different application features here for you. Now this WebEx calling application features, there's gonna be two flavors here. You got your full desktop application that you can install on your PC, laptop, or uh, Mac, right? And then there's a WebEx calling mobile. This would be kind of like your iPad and or Android based stuff. So um, you can kind of see that you have kind of, uh, the main basic features like, you know, being able to make a voice phone call or being able to make a video phone call. But there are just certain things that you can do on the desktop that you can't do on the mobile and vice versa, right? But um, again, that list is not so much as kind of like the station differences that we saw in the past, right? So anyway, um, one of the key things here is that um, if you are using that desktop application, you do have integration options with other applications out there, not just with Cisco products, but with things like Outlook. Right. So if you've integrated any kind of like um, Outlook integration within the control hub, you should be able to access all of that stuff here within that desktop application. Right. Um, other things too. Um, you see one for Skype for business add on. That's also something that, you know, is offered for desktop integration as well. Something that you don't get with mobile. Okay. And then um, kind of the last kind of features and comparison things that I want to talk to you guys about is kind of the different kind of features that you can configure on WebEx calling, right? So um, yeah, you can configure things like authentication for your endpoints, uh, call park and or call retrieval. So uh, this is a form of call coverage um, inside of call manager. The idea is that I can place the call on hold and then um, if you had some kind of a PA system, you can publicly announce, hey, somebody's out there. Can somebody go over to the nearest phone and you know, dial 1000 and pick up this call that's on hold? So you can do call park. Um, there's call hunting that can be configured here. Uh, dial plan management. Um, we have call pickup, which is another form of call, you know, uh, uh, call hunting. Um, there is intercepting, there's an intercept user, which is essentially just taking the call from somebody. There's going to be um, routing based on caller ID, there's music on hold, and then there's even a end user portal, um, kind of like call managers end user interface, right? So we call that the self care portal in call manager. Um, here they also have a voice portal, which allows the end user to kind of log in and customize their own um, phone or device, right? They could change the way call routing works for call forwarding. They can change the way that their phone appearance looks. Um, and they can toggle certain features and subscribe to, you know, phone services if they wish to do that, right? So same kind of functionalities as a lot of the things call manager offers. Okay. Um, then there are some other features in here that must be activated in WebEx Control Hub, and then you would have to provision it or ask your provider to help you provision this stuff for you. So things like um, an auto attendant, 
which is nice, right? Um, that you get with this product. So um, this auto attendant functionality, typically on an on-prem solution, you'd have to have some other application that you'd have to install on a server, right? Or a virtual server to be able to have, um, like UCCX or UCCE to provide this auto attendant functionality or Unity connection for that matter, right? Uh, but with WebEx calling, I guess this stuff is included. You just gotta activate it and then provision that feature for an auto attendant. Uh, it does have uh, an idea here for native call queuing for hunting purposes, right? Um, they do have paging, receptionist kind of um, things that we can configure, and uh, Skype for business and or link integration, like I mentioned before. Okay. So, any questions about those features, folks? Alrighty, let's close this out then. Um, the next things I really want to do is I really want to talk about all the different types of architectures that you guys might see. So, you know, depending on who you are, one of these architectures might be um, something that you're looking into. Uh, but before we get to the architecture, I guess the thing that I want to do is talk about the different components here, right? So, uh, you know, this will probably help us out a little bit later when we start talking about the different architectures, but you have a router and you have a switch. What's the difference between these type of components here, right? So I'm gonna take you guys back into this networking class. Um, the idea with the router is that for the functions on my network, my router essentially routes traffic between two different networks, right? And those two different networks would look like kind of like a 10110 slash 24. Then on the other side of my router, I got a 192.168.1.0 slash 24. And that works for the router, right? Because the router's goal here is to route traffic between two different networks. You couldn't do this with the router where, you know, on one side I have a 1011, and on the other side I also have like a 1011X slash 24. That doesn't work with the router. So again, you can't do that for the router, okay? So that's kind of what the role of the router is. Now, the difference between the router and the switch is very obvious because in the switch, you could have an endpoint that's connected to the switch that's a 10.1.1.1. And you could also have another endpoint connected to the switch that's a 10.1.1.2. And you'll notice that these two IPs kind of look the same, right? The, you know, I have um, on one part of the network, I'm 10.1.1. On the other side of the network, I'm also part of the 10.1.1 network. So the role of the switch on the network is that we switch traffic within the same network, if you will, right? So um, very opposite of the way that the router works. Switches will switch traffic within the same network. Routers will route traffic between two different networks, okay? Now, other components that you're gonna see here on a couple of these slides for the architecture is you'll see that the, there's things out there for your voice gateway. What does a voice gateway do for us? Well, for traditionally, the voice gateway would say, well, we will, it looks like a router, but it really is not performing a routed function, is it? It's performing, it's performing a voice gateway function. So that voice gateway functionality is this, is that you have a PSTN that's a non-IP, okay? Connecting to something that is IP. So when we start thinking about these type of protocols, we start thinking about things like, oh, H323 or SIP or MGCP. These are gateway IP protocols that typically register to call manager or talk to call manager or talk to some kind of a call processing system, right? And, you know, this voice gateway is kind of doing that. It's bridging the communication between two different networks, just like your router did with those two different IP networks, right? Except when we deal with a voice gateway, this will convert between non-IP networks to IP networks is the way that the voice gateway works, okay? Um, the other thing that you guys might see here is that there is discussions about cubes, V cubes, session port controller. What the heck do these things do? Well, kind of like the same thing that we talked about with the voice gateway, right? 
The cube, on the other hand, will say, well, you may have a PSTN, but in this case, this may be IP based because a lot of the, you know, in these cases, your PSTN provider is probably a SIP provider, right? But SIP is IP. So it's not like our PSTN is a non IP network anymore. And that will communicate to like your internal network, which you will probably speak the same kind of protocols, H323, SIP, and or MGCP. So the difference between that voice gateway and that cube is really one talks to a non-IP network for PSTN and one talks to another IP network. So cubes will talk from IP to IP. Voice gateways don't, right? Voice gateways, they have to convert something. They have to go from a non-IP network to an IP network. But these days, this is what a lot of people are seeing is that you guys will probably have some kind of cube to connect to your PSTN provider, okay? And that's all it is. It's just trying to communicate IP to IP, right? And you know, some people still don't get it because some people are like, well, why do I need that session border controller? Remember that this supports a lot of different things. It supports things like um, uh, protocol interworking. So if you, are, if the provider's dealing with a certain protocol, you decide you're dealing with another protocol, you can interwork between those two different protocols if you have this cube or session border controller, okay? Cube is just what we like to call Cisco's SBC, okay? And I guess uh, the, the, the idea of a session border controller, if you just call it that, it's, you know, uh, it's a session border controller, but not Cisco branded, right? So cube versus a session border controller, it's all the same thing to me. Um, another thing here is that it does provide you with a form of security, right? Uh, because you are, this is essentially just a router, right? Um, so this could be a router, it could be a virtualized router, if you will, that is what a vCube is. Um, I can perform a security function. Um, so I can interwork between protocols and I can perform that security here. Okay. Um, PSTN, again, I want you guys to think of this as this could be non-IP, but this could also be IP, right? So you could have a SIP provider that's connecting you to the public switch telephone network or you can have a non-IP network like our traditional PSTN used to be for analog links, okay? So that's kind of the cloud that I want you guys to be aware of here. Now, there's another cloud out there that we're going to see. That's our WebEx calling cloud, okay? These two clouds are not one and of the same. Remember what I told you guys in the beginning. What is Cisco WebEx calling? It is a PBX of sorts, right? But... WebEx calling does not do you the service of providing PSTN connectivity. That is up to the provider, right? Um, and the customer to kind of hash out. So again, Cisco is just hosting this solution. Um, so your provider will probably give you kind of like, or will work with you to kind of get that PSTN connectivity, however it is that you try to do that, right? So anyway, those are kind of some of the things that will help us out. Um, the other thing that I will kind of want to note here is WebEx calling cloud. There's a lot of stuff in that cloud, but remember, um, this is a software as a subscription, folks. Um, so it's not like you really care what's out there, right? There's, again, redundant servers out there. There's a bunch of SBCs so that they can talk to the partner and or the customer. Um, you know, there are load balancers out there. There's servers that are performing network functionality. And then there's, I drew a picture of call manager here, but really this is just a call control system, right? It's not call manager, but I know that's what the picture is. Um, and the idea here is as kind of a provider or as a customer, you're going to be logging into this system using the World Wide Web, right? And uh, as, as soon as you log on with your admin credentials, you should be able to go in here and provision additional users and or provision some of these phone features within the control hub, okay? Um, so yeah, everybody will at some point 
be able to access that call control to be able to configure some of those features. Or you're, if you're the custom type of customer where you want to be hands off with your phone system, you want to have your provider configure all of it for you, by all means, you can do that as well. Okay. And so the provider can log in and make configurations on your behalf. Okay. So um, that's kind of the way that we're going to control the administration of this particular platform here is to log into that WebEx calling cloud and make our configurations within Control Hub. Okay. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of different things inside of this WebEx calling cloud. I just don't want you guys to get too uh, mixed, you know, don't think too hard about what's in there, right? Because that's Cisco's responsibility, if you will. They're the ones that are responsible for upkeeping these servers for, um, you know, the upgrade cycles, uh, for making sure that these services are up for you. Um, so anyway, a uh, couple of different architectures. I'll show you how things work and then we'll be finished with this, um, you know, with this session and then I'll open it up to questions if you guys have any. So um, as far as the architecture goes, you can have WebEx calling PSTN that is cloud connected. Now you'll notice that I have a scenario here where um, I have two different locations in WebEx calling. And um, the idea here is maybe I don't have any local PSTN resources, right? Or maybe I've not looked into my local PSTN resources, whatever the case. So what I've done is I've gone to one of Cisco's um, approved partners, right? Uh, it's one of Cisco's partners. And then I asked them, hey, I want to purchase WebEx calling. So um, what they're responsible for is they will be responsible for everything if it's cloud connected here, okay? So what's going to happen is you're going to connect to them to some kind of internet connection. And you'll notice that this peer network here, this is really the provider's network. This is not Cisco's, Cisco's network's right here, okay? They're providing the WebEx calling platform, but your provider or Cisco's partner they will be the one that are going to be supplying the connection to either they probably are connected to some kind of PSTN and or perhaps, you know, you have another site that they are not providing PSTN access for. So they could actually link you to other PSTN providers, right? So the idea with cloud connected calling here would be I have a bunch of different WebEx calling endpoints. And you'll notice that there are a couple of different D, uh, extension ranges here. What you've essentially done is you've gone into Cisco WebEx calling and you've configured those extensions. Okay, so I have certain sites that go to certain places. Now, if I pick up the phone and I dial 2001, what's going to happen is I will probably send the signaling to WebEx calling using SIP signaling. Okay, just like with any other kind of call control that you would have with like call manager or any other kind of IP PBX, right? So um, you send the SIP signaling here to WebEx calling, then WebEx calling is gonna do its call control or call processing. Um, some of the rules with this is, if you've configured the dial plan within WebEx calling, it will automatically know where to go. So if you dial 2001, it will know that that potentially matches your location number two here. So WebEx calling will look at what's registered here and we'll send the signaling back down to location two so that one of the phones will ring, right? As soon as the phone rings, you will establish the RTP connection between your two endpoints, right? So just like with everything else, as soon as this sets up the connection, you will have your RTP stream set up between your two devices. Okay. Um, one of the other rules that I want to tell you is what if I don't dial 2001? What if I'm dialing something else? Like, let's say I'm dialing 555-1111. Okay. Well, then the thing about it is if it's not within your dial plan, because my dial plan is only 1XXX or 2XXX in this case, if it's not within your dial plan, the idea here is that I would be able to send this call out to a certain provider of sorts, right? So in this particular scenario here, another configuration that you might see inside of WebEx calling is, you know, for location one, 
I might tell myself that if you guys cannot connect, you know, if, if you're trying to dial some destination that's, that's unknown by WebEx calling, I'm going to use a gateway resource of some kind. And if this is a cloud connected provider, or we like to call these CCPs, right? But if um, you needed to go to a certain cloud provider, I might say that location one is always going to be linked to cloud connection provider A. So in this case, when I tried to dial out to the PSTN from location one, um, the idea is, you know, if I don't know how to route it, I'm going to route you to this PSTN, right? And then inside of WebEx calling, we might actually configure some other kind of call routing to say, you know what, location two, we may want to go to CCPB for cloud connected provider number B. So that would be a little bit different because when I make that call, because I'm a different location, like maybe on the East Coast or maybe I'm in the West Coast, right? I use a different type of provider. Now, all of this mapping is usually done by the provider, right? So when you get onboarded from your provider, this is the things that they will help you get set up with if it's cloud connected, right? And of course, if the provider can handle this connection for you, they may have their own PSTN connection. They might be able to handle this connection for themselves, right? But this makes it easy for, I guess, the customer or you guys, if you're going to be purchasing this um, software, because you don't have to worry about any local gateway requirements. You don't have to worry about buying any special routers or anything like that. You just got to worry about paying for the user-based licenses to be able to have access to this software. Okay. So Cloud Connect is typically the easiest, but typically this will incur the most charges, right? Because this is the most hands-off you're going to get. Um, the other very popular way of getting to this connection would be a single local gateway, right? So if we take a look at what the single local gateway does and how that's different, you'll notice that there is no cloud connection here. So if you have a local gateway set up for your own PSDN connection, the idea here is that cloud connected partner this gets decoupled, okay? So uh, WebEx calling is not gonna be connected to any kind of PSD and cloud in this particular case, at least for not for this tenant or not for this customer. And so um, the same kind of idea though, if you're going to have local PSD and connection, then um, if this is a non IP network, um, I guess you'd be using the voice gateway uh, that you would have to kind of register back to WebEx calling to make it aware of where to send these calls, right? Um, if it was an IP network, say this was like a SIP PSTN network for a SIP provider, then I guess you'd be using a cube instead of your voice gateway, right? Um, and then that cube would have to talk to the WebEx calling cloud so that WebEx calling would know exactly where to send these calls, all right? Um, one of the things that some people ask is, Ben, what about redundancy? What about survivability? What if one of these things crap out on me, right? Well, that's where your vCube comes into play. Because if you guys are connecting to a SIP provider and your cube essentially goes down, uh, one of the things that you can do here is you can have a high availability virtual cube that can kind of uh, take over as the new active cube if the current active one goes down, right? And then it would be able to handle all the signaling to and from the PSDN and WebEx call instead. So there is some survivability here that you guys can have in a local site, right? So um, very much like how this will work inside of the WebEx calling cloud, what you're going to do here is you would say, well, if this is my location number one, I would, direct calls to be routed based on, I guess this would be for C, uh, instead of pointing this to the cloud connected provider, um, like we did on the last page, instead of doing something like that, we will point to your uh, local gateway or whatever it might be. It could be a local gateway and or a local cube acting as your gateway. So that's kind of the way that the mapping is gonna work within Control Hub, if you guys ever see that. Right. Again, calling works exactly the same. You're still signaling SIP 
to get here. If you need to talk to somewhere internal, which is a known destination, it will automatically signal SIP to come back out and then we can establish our RTP stream, right? And just so you guys know, the RTP stream does not typically go between these two devices like it usually does with call manager, right? The RTP stream typically goes inside of the WebEx calling cloud. That's what makes it secure, okay? Um, so, I'm sorry, I know I have a question. Let me take a peek at what that question really is. Uh, does it get natted? So you can have NAT. So if you have NAT, uh, your cube should be able to handle that session, right? So it does handle uh, sessions that get natted uh, perfectly fine. There is firewall traversal uh, that you can configure with this stuff too. So if you are natting, um, it can still work, okay? Um, but yeah, the signaling will still work. You just got to have a firewall with certain policies to allow that to work, uh, to allow the signaling to go through the firewall um, and or for that NAT traversal. Okay. But. Okay. Um, the different, the, uh, this is probably more of what I'm expecting for a lot of people, right? Especially those of you coming from on-prem solutions. So in the on-prem solutions, you got local gateway with IPPVX um, CUCM. So the difference here is that, hey, maybe you had an existing call manager and now we're gonna migrate to WebEx calling. How's that gonna work, right? Well, you would still have, I guess, two different sets of devices. You'd have CUCM endpoints registered call manager, right? And then you'd have WebEx endpoints that essentially go talk to that WebEx cloud, right? Now, the idea here would be for your WebEx endpoints, how would you be able to talk to CUCM? Like what kind of numbers would you be able to dial, right? So just so you guys know, between WebEx calling and I guess CUCM, you can have a lot of different ways that you can dial. You can dial internal numbers, or you can also dial full PSTN numbers, okay? So if you guys are gonna present any number to Cisco WebEx calling, the preferred method is to use E164 dialing, okay? So that E164 dialing is preferred here for globalized call routing and number normalization. So um, that is gonna be something that we're gonna to have to get used to for WebEx calling is to use E164. But the idea would be, hey, what if my WebEx calling, what if I decide to dial 2001? in this case, which happens to be this phone right here. I would signal to WebEx calling, and then here's what WebEx calling would do. You would have to configure CUCM endpoints, I guess, it as part of your dial plan, so that your WebEx calling would know to be able to signal to the local cube, and then from your local gateway and or cube, you would be able to send that over to call manager so that call manager would then route the call out to your 2001 phone, right? And vice versa. If your CUCM endpoints wanna make a phone call to WebEx calling, it would kind of do the same thing. You would signal the call manager, present certain digits to it, right? Then call manager would have some kind of a route pattern that would point to some kind of a SIP trunk that probably points to your cube. And then that cube would then direct the call to WebEx calling. WebEx calling would then come back and say, oh yeah, I have one of those 1000 destinations here. Go ahead and ring 1000. So you can make calls between WebEx calling and on-prem solutions like PBXs or you know, on-prem CUCM. But the main point is that all calls will go through that Cisco Unified Border Element, okay? Or through your local gateway, okay? If you dial full PSTN numbers, I guess it can go through the PSTN and then come back through the local gateway to hit call manager. But most of the time, you're probably going to want to go through that cube scenario, okay? But, um, that's how that's gonna work with IP, PBX, and CUCM. Again, Cube is gonna be the bridge between the two phone systems, if you will, okay? What if you have multiple local gateways? Um, so here I have lots of different locations. And if you'll notice, the difference here is that I have different connections to the PSTNs at different locations. So here's one of the things that you guys will be able to see is like call routing will all work the same. 
except inside of Cisco WebEx calling, what you're going to do is you're going to be able to map these things. And one of the rules of routing, I guess, for WebEx calling is if you have a location, okay, I have three different locations here, each location must be assigned to some kind of local gateway. So in this particular case, I may have gateway A and I may have gateway B over here because I have a cube or voice gateway set up. So here, when I set this up, I say, well, location one, I want to handle this to go to gateway A, right? And or if I have location two, maybe I also want to point that to gateway A. But I also have location three which will be able to point to gateway B over here. You guys see that? So that mapping has to be done inside of the control hub, okay? And the rule typically is every location that you configure within WebEx calling must be associated to some kind of local gateway, but only one local gateway, okay? Now you can point multiple locations to a single gateway, but every location can only point to one destination here, okay? And before you start thinking, well, what happens when gateway A fails, right? Remember, if gateway A fails inside of configuration, this could be like a V cube, right? So this could be a cube that has like a primary and secondary virtualized solution so that if one goes down, again, you still have some type of call survivability. So. Um, that's the call survivability that you have. But typically in the control hub, they only reference one destination, if you will, and only one destination, okay? And it's up to you to kind of virtualize things, um, I guess, as the customer on the back end. So, all right, folks, I think that concludes my discussion on WebEx calling. Uh, 